most founders, most companies, and I'm speaking a bit out of turn here, but most of the time they have an idea and they, man, I can do X and I'm going to start a company that does X. But this is like 17 ideas all stuck into one really cool application. Like when the founders started, and I, have you been with the company since the beginning or, okay. Pretty close. So what was the original passion idea that they were trying to get on paper? Was it, I can do this thing with tires? Yeah, so so it's a bit more complicated than that, like like you'd expect it to be. The the cool thing about this group is that the the original founders of the business, uh, to, you know, two of them are, two of them are here, Marsha and Wayne, and they had grown businesses over many many years. I mean, the good, you know, again, you treat treat uh, treat what you've got as a positive, right? So the benefit of all this gray hair that we all have as a team here. Um, is that this isn't our first rodeo. This isn't the first time we've done startups. This isn't the first large-scale business that we've built. Um, you know, for me personally, I was I was uh, part of Sony Ericsson. Uh, that's why I'm in North Carolina. So I ran a large supply chain team there. And before that, I ran a division of what used to be uh, TRW. Today is Northrop Grumman. The benefit of doing big company stuff and multiple startups is – you, you don't tend to die on a hill in the same way a startup founder does when it's their first startup, right? This, this idea is so good. It's the only thing that's going to work and it's the only thing I'm going to focus on, right? So, so you know, um, Wayne particularly came out of the space program. Uh, he was heavily involved in building semiconductor companies. Um, you know, another one of our, of our uh, team is a guy called Jason Williams. He's a healthcare guy. He's, he's fairly well known locally. He sold uh, a, uh, his clinic, mobile, uh, his um, mobile healthcare business, uh, what, seven years ago for a, something approaching half a billion dollars. You know, nice. the benefit of having some of this pedigree around us is that we make better mistakes. Um, we does, which doesn't mean we don't make any because you always make some, right? But hopefully you make better quality mistakes. When it came to founding the business, what Wayne and Marsha were trying to do uh, was, was solve an environmental problem. And they looked at all sorts of different things. They spent a lot of time doing research. Again, the luxury of it, of it being a founding of business after you've done it a few times is you don't have to rush. Take your time, do some research, do some studying, do some reading, do some travel, figure out if this thing's real. And then at that point, then go out to your friends and family and say, hey, I've got something kind of interesting. Hey, you've invested with me before. I made you money last time. Put a bit of money in this and we'll see what happens. And the benefit of going in the, in the, on the journey in that way is that what we've been able to do together is take our time. And time is a benefit in, in what we've been doing because lots and lots of other people in the last 50 plus years have tried to do something positive with tires and most of them have failed. And uh, again, we don't need to get into the details of why they failed, but the point is, you know, we've, we have taken the time to do a, a different approach, to take the time to prove that it works and then to document it then to protect it. And the benefit of that journey, and we had the governor of North Carolina come visit us last week, uh, is that we stayed kind of in a quiet mode for a long time where people, even in living in the same community, didn't know we existed. And we kind of liked that because it meant we could spend time making the news, not reporting the news. You know, again, many startup founders want to be, you know, uh, in front of the cameras or, or you know, on the, in the newspaper or whatever it might be early on probably before they're ready and therefore they get a lot of attention. It's a distraction. It's a resource drain. And uh, we really avoided doing that. We've had very, very uh, scarce amounts of uh, public attention until we really have started being ready for it, which has only been in the last few months. Speaking to a new founder or someone who's thinking about being a founder, you've done this, you've been this down the street several times. What would be the best advice? But I mean, I love the take your time, but if I don't have those resources that you're talking about, right, you've started successfully, someone probably brought in a good amount of investment just privately because they are, they've done very well. That guy, half a billion dollars, it's nice. Um, that, that gives you advantages. But if you are one of those young, hungry startups, what would be your best advice to give to them as they get moving? You know, so when I first um, started working in the U.S. 25, 30 years ago, you know, we had some um, 
training events that where we had people come in and talk to us about motivational training and how do you how do you encourage and how do you develop your career and one of the pieces of advice that that, that I heard back then which still resonates today is um, if you find someone if you want to be successful go find someone who's already successful in that space and ask them how they did it and when you ask for advice not help people are more likely to give you advice people are more willing to give you advice and uh, again, I think my read of that would be, look, if you're starting a business, go find someone in a non-competitive uh, walk of life, uh, maybe a different geography or a different, uh, different, slightly different vertical. Go ask them how they've been successful. Uh, you know, encourage, go find your own mentor, go find your own supporters, go find your own experts. And whether that is by choosing which investors to, to, to pick up their money or whether it's uh, who to add to your team or it's who socially to meet with where they've been successful in their career in something somewhat similar, go get that advice. Because if you only hear half their advice and only act on half of that, you're still way ahead of where you would have been if you'd done this in your own basement and done it on your own, right? And, and you know, the, the most expensive money is equity. So when you start raising money and then you make the wrong decisions and then you have to change, it's a very, very painful process because you're using other people's money to do that. And you're also uh, needing to then have an answer to those people that have invested in you as to what went wrong. So I think it's super important to get as much advice as you can in as condensed a way as possible and really to find people that are like minded. We, we have, you know, forgive me, we have kind of a no policy in terms of our investors and our, and our board and our shareholders. And, and that has been really great because it means that, look, you know, not everyone's always on the same page, but we've really worked hard to be very straightforward, uh, very accurate and very clear with what's going on with the business, good and bad. And, it, and if you feel that way and act that way and the people that have supported you are, the, are good human beings, um, then we'll figure it out together. You've mentioned that you are growing and you are starting to show off the business to other potential yeah. investors and clients, not just in the U.S., but worldwide. Is there anything that you wanted to share about where you see this going in the future coming up? You know, look, unfortunately, um, whether it's whether it's car tires, scooters, bicycles, motorbikes, you know, tires are a problem pretty much everywhere. You know, the Arctic Circle and Antarctica are fairly OK. Right. But everywhere else on the planet, there's a lot of tires. And, you know, I think it's what, 1830 something, um, you know, the tire or the vulcanization process was discovered. Uh, since then, uh, there's been really not no successful way of breaking tires down in a way that's been economically viable. So there's a lot of tires. What we're seeing is that that opportunity exists worldwide uh, for this technology. Now, we would love there to be more healthy uh, competition scaling. Um, so far, we're not seeing it. We're seeing a few pockets of things that are interesting. But but look, we, we need to build lots and lots of locations. Um, we see that opportunity in Asia, in, in uh, uh, Europe, in uh, the African continent, in South America, as well as North America. You know, this is a problem for everybody. And, uh, you know, we look forward to being a part of it. What we are seeing, though, is that uh, we are somewhat fortunate if that's it's kind of a weird way to be fortunate. But in the U.S., at least we have a somewhat of an organized consolidation program, which is that when you get rid of tires, someone takes them somewhere and then someone else takes them somewhere from there. And then they wind up being most of them go in landfills. But at least there's landfills. This is so interesting. I mean, I, my favorite thing about having guests on is I, they've been all over the map, like. Just you never know who you, they're all they've all started something or they're all running something. And that's been the the one key component. But the businesses, I'm my inherent fascination with businesses is why I run my little company is so I can learn about different businesses. And this podcast mm -hmm. has turned into an extension of that. So it's just so interesting. I had no idea a business like this even existed. And that's so cool um, to take something that is a problem and turning it into. I've always said, if you want environmentalism to work then make it an economic thing. Mm -hmm. It's like it, light bulbs are always a great example. If when, when, when I was a kid, you know, everybody said, turn your lights off because we want to be good to the planet. No one listened. 
except mm-hmm. for they wanted to save money, right? And then they said, oh, change your light bulbs. Well, now now new light bulbs cost a tenth what they, the power out of them. And so people are like, oh yeah, I'll change those light bulbs. You make it economic, people will get green. Same with, I've always, <laughs> another thing I've always said, if you want to see change in this world, make gas $5 in America. And because we just hate expensive gas for whatever reason. I think it's just because you see it when you're driving. Uh, but expensive gas just drives a hole straight through the soul of America. And we get really, really innovative and when, when that happens. And we're seeing some of that now. We've seen it in the past. But it's almost always an economic thing. And so you're taking that ex- exact thing and saying, hey, we can take this problem and turn it into a real solution. Energy, which we always need. You can never... As far as I can tell, you can never run, make too much energy. I think, you know, look, whether it's an environmental business or any business, right? If it has business in the name, it's supposed to be economically viable. When I've worked with startups, especially really young ones, straight out of college or maybe still even in college, often I would hear a similar vein of, I want to build a company and give away my service. Mm Mm-hmm. And I would have this conversation with them over and over again. There is no business if there is no business. If you give away everything and you make no money, you don't exist. You can't give away something you don't have. And I, it's almost like I have to change their direction to say having a business and profit is not a bad thing. That's allowing you to do some great things that you want to do. But until the business is in of itself a business... None of those great things happen. Business has got to be fun. You've got to enjoy doing it because sometimes it sucks and sometimes it's really hard and sometimes it's pure fun. And uh, if it's not mostly fun, then you're not going to sustain yourself through the dark days. Um, You know, I think that you've also got to make sure that you stay nimble because uh, your business is changing. You know, the environment's changing. And I think the last two, three years, we've all seen a world that's changed. Um, and you know, so if, if human, human beings don't like change very much, even though it's an inevitability, uh, just recognize that, that you have to be at least watchful for it and embrace it as much as possible. All right, Gary, if anybody wants to ask any questions or get in touch with us, how would they do that? Uh, they could always just send us an email at hello at the big pixel.net, or they can reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. We're on all of them. Or you can make a a comment down on our YouTube page where this podcast is broadcast.